Hey everyone, Raptor Chatter here, and we're going to be looking at some of the biggest paleontology finds of September 2023. Let's get started. First, a fairly robust specimen of this early sauropodomorph Borreolestes was discovered, and based on the thickness of its femur, it probably weighed about twice what the other ones would have, meaning about 30 pounds or 15 kilograms. The early sauropodomorphs weren't exactly massive but it does show a lot of diversity and variation within single species, meaning that potentially that is one way that they were able to do so well during the Triassic and then later in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Garumba Titan morulensis is a new Somphospondylin sauropod coming from Spain. The Somphospondylins is the group that includes both the titanosaurs, so some of the really, really, really large dinosaurs, as well as a number of their closest relatives. So things like Sauroposeidon, which itself was also very, very large. So when we're looking at this animal, we need to understand that there was some diversity in the titanosaurs that lived in Spain and the Iberian Peninsula around this time during the Cretaceous to Jurassic boundary. In fact, it might even suggest that some of the largest titanosaurs may have gotten a start around this area, as the Iberian Peninsula wasn't a peninsula yet, but probably a little bit more like an island, and may have been able to help connect these various places that were breaking up as Pangaea broke up. And not necessarily saying there are land bridges, but even just some of the smaller animals floating on debris could have spread across the world from somewhere like Iberia in the middle of the early Atlantic Ocean. An alternative option though is just because it was in the middle, many of the other clades that developed elsewhere could have ended up in parts of Iberia. There were also some new teeth coming from a Macronarian sauropod, also from Spain, and this time right near the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. These are interesting because the Macronarians are also including the Somphospondylins and a few of their closest relatives. So it's interesting to see these because this really helps to imply that, yeah, there was just a lot of diversity in Spain during this time period. But that's not the only sauropod news coming from September. Jingji Titan Gaojuensis is a new titanosaur coming from China, and it's mostly a handful of vertebra, but there's enough there to help us know that it is something totally distinct from what's been found. Knowing that it's a titanosaur, it does help to add some more diversity to the titanosaurs in Asia, and so hopefully with that we'll also be able to understand their kind of evolutionary radiation, especially as some of them eventually started getting into parts of North Africa, so we can understand really what the biogeography and migration patterns or even just dispersal patterns of these organisms might have been. Tyrannomimus fukuiensis is a new theropod coming from the Fukui prefecture in Japan, and it seems really closely related to things like Dinochirus, this really large ornithomimid that would have eaten plants mostly, and that's interesting because combined with a few other fossils in Japan, such as Fukui raptor and early Megaraptorin, and Fukui venator, but which was potentially the earliest known or earliest diverging therizinosaur, it seems like East Asia may have been really important for the diversity of Solurosaurs which includes everything from tyrannosaurs all the way down to the birds. And that's especially true when you also look at many of the fossils coming from China with feathers preserved. Feathers are often composed of alpha keratin in the fossil record, which is interesting because modern feathers are mostly composed of beta keratin. And that begs the question, was there a chemical shift in the feather construction during evolution? Or is there some sort of other bias that's occurring? And it turns out it's probably that bias if you put feathers under the conditions where we do have them preserved, and you then put them under pressure like they would be in a geologic setting, turns out a lot of those beta keratin sheets swap into alpha keratin. And so there is this bias of the chemicals actually changing some of their structures just due to the pressure and heat of being buried. I mention that because a lot of feathered fossils are coming from China and specifically the Yanliao biota. And that's what this paper sought to look at, not necessarily those fossils or feathers, but rather the age of it. And what they were able to identify is about 6 million years of time within basically one environment in China, meaning that there's 6 million years for us to be able to look at some of the earlier fossils that include some of the first gliding mammals, such as things like Volatic Ethereum, which I did a whole video on, and then eventually some of the first birds. So it's really interesting and hopefully we'll be able to make some better ecological inferences throughout the entire time period that this environment existed. And sometimes there's other ways to try and infer what soft tissues might have been like, and that's mostly by looking at evolutionary history and modern analogs, and that includes with brains. Specifically, this paper was looking at snake brains, because in general it's thought that snakes evolved mostly underground. They would have been fossorial, living underground, and eating things mostly underground. 
This is especially true when you look at the earliest branching group of snakes today, the Leptotyphlopids, or blind snakes, which is a little bit more reasonable of a name. They live underground largely and eat ants and termites. They're really hard to study because they're underground, but we can at least say that about them. And so it's thought the first snakes may have been doing something similar. However, by taking brain scans of many hundreds of snakes that are mostly alive today, and a few fossil ones, the researchers were able to suggest that yeah, there would be some fossorial adaptations in the brain of the first hypothetical ancestral snake. However, that's not all there would have been. Certain parts of the brain would have been large enough for them to actually exhibit more complex behaviors and come out on the surface at least occasionally. So it doesn't seem like they were entirely limited to lives underground. It's just some of them took that to an extreme level and some of them didn't. There's also one of the oldest known preserved brain cases in a vertebrate that was found. This one coming from an early jawed fish named Ereptychus americanus, which was named in 1892. Researchers have had a really hard time trying to link the shape of the brain case for non-modern day jawed fishes to the groups that would become modern day jawed fishes. And this fossil really helps to answer part of why that is. And that seems to be because the brain case was cartilaginous, but more importantly, it wasn't fused into just one single brain case. So what that means is that instead, as other jawed fish started to fuse their brain cases, before they did that, they probably calcified them into bone instead of cartilage, and then they fused secondarily. So it helps to really fill in this important gap for how the brain case actually evolved in fish, and that would include tetrapods, which were the vertebrates that made it to land. So it's really interesting to be able to see this with this new earliest fossil brain case. But there's other things you can do with skulls than just look at brain cases. You can also look at bite strength. And that's what this paper did for Tyrannosaur ids. So not just Tyrannosaurus, but some of its relatives. What they found out is that in Tyrannosaurus specifically, it had an astronomically powerful bite even compared to other late Cretaceous Tyrannosaurids like Displetosaurus. What this means is there was something very unique about Tyrannosaurus specifically that caused it to actually have that bite. It wasn't something that's quite as straightforward as Displetosaurus or Teratophonius, which are both moderately large Tyrannosaurids with similar bite pressures. It's just Tyrannosaurus, even juvenile Tyrannosaurus, did something entirely different to power their jaws more aggressively. Now, unfortunately, they didn't look at a lot of the other early Tyrannosauroids, which potentially could have had other biting mechanisms involved and would have been some of the first steps towards that very powerful bite in Tyrannosaurus. So, Hopefully there will be some future research involving those animals so we can get a better idea of how exactly they may have been feeding and how exactly their place in the environment and their feeding strategies may have changed. And speaking of mouths and jaws, we look to a Nathosaurine, a group of pterosaurs that lived during the late Jurassic, and this one comes from Portugal. Lusonathus almadrava is this new Nathosaurine, meaning its teeth would have been fairly tightly packed However, this one's a little bit different. Many of its relatives in the Tenochasmids, including Nathosaurus, had very fine teeth packed closely together and were probably filter feeding. But Nathosaurus had much more robust teeth, as you can see here. What this means is it was probably catching more fish than just filter feeding like it's believed the other Tenochasmids and Nathosaurus did. So it helps add a lot of diversity to this group because it's doing something entirely different with its jaws. It's not really filter feeding, it's going after larger prey, something we didn't think existed in this group. Just south of Portugal, we get to Morocco, and there were some new trackways found in Morocco dating to the middle to the late Jurassic. And this is kind of a big deal because the middle Jurassic in general sucks for places to find fossils for animals that lived on land, and here we at least have a few. There's some theropod footprints, as well as some sauropod footprints, maybe a pterosaur, and most interestingly, a potential bird footprint, or bird-like animal. Birds should have been evolving around that time, so it is not entirely unlikely that it could be a bird, it's just really hard to know for sure. Birds in general are very hollow boned, so don't fossilize well. However, finding a footprint like this that suggests, hey, there was one here, is more likely. A bird will only have one skeleton to give up for fossilization in its lifetime, but may leave thousands of footprints if it's living on or near the ground. Hopefully there will be some more research involving some of these fossils so we can more accurately identify some of them. It's a little bit hard to do that sometimes. Or potentially at least look in this formation in other parts of it and maybe even find a fossil of one. It'd be really interesting and really cool to see.
But there's still more footprints that were found, this time from the giant sand dunes that are fossilized of the Botucatu Formation. Farlo Ichnus rapidus is this new ichnogenus, which just means that it's the name for this specific type of track. Each type of track gets their own ichnogenus, and that's how we tell them apart from one another. And this one, importantly, doesn't have two of the toes of a three-toed foot showing, the other two toes being lifted off the ground and the runner running on just one toe. This has actually already been talked about a little bit where it was mentioned in passing previously, and then mentioned again with the discovery of Vespersaurus, which seemingly ran on just one toe. It's also very, very small though. But it helps to show, combined with some of those other footprints coming from Argentina, that this animal, or at least lineages like it, were pretty widespread across South America. So they were doing well for themselves in this giant desert. And still slightly on the subject of ichnofossils, we're actually going to go to a time where there's really not any ichnofossils, and that's the Ediacaran, when life was really just starting to diversify, even before the Cambrian. And this paper sought to see why some of those organisms that lived during the Ediacaran didn't really make it into the Cambrian. They looked at a number of different ideas, and basically came to just a small series of conclusions. First of all, these organisms that were evolving evolved into other things, and sometimes those other species were bad for the other animals that were around at the time. So it could have just been predation that led to the extinction of what we know from the Ediacaran. Additionally, there could have very well been other more important factors from those organisms, though, other than predation. And one of those that I think is really interesting is actually bioturbation, meaning essentially when you have worms and things going through the mud, they're going to mess with how things attach to the mud. Meaning that potentially those organisms just couldn't survive because they kept getting disrupted by new life forms digging through the soil. Additionally, there is some mention of biomineralization. This means things like brachiopods or trilobites developing their shells. It's a mineralized shell that they would have had. This could have just protected them from predation, but also potentially buffered some of the effects that different chemistries would have had on the organisms, giving them just another additional layer of protection to different environments. And finally, they point out that it's really important to remember that the Ediacaran extinction is not like any of the other mass extinctions in Earth's history. It's not like everything died and then suddenly diversified. It was just kind of a faunal turnover. You have a lot of organisms around, and then they just gradually change into other organisms, at least as far as their place in the environment is concerned. So it's really important to understand that we can't necessarily just compare this to other extinctions. We need to think up some new ways to really try and analyze this specific event. As for some of those organisms during the Ediacaran, there's a new one, Acrophilus, which is very similar to some of the Ediacaran frond fossils. This one is told from the others by having a distinct stalk that really only shows up on one side of the fossil, so it is interesting and it is somewhat distinct. Additionally, they mention that they might have some discs that would have been holdfasts. Essentially, that's where the organism would have attached to the ground and then stretched up into the water column in order to filter feed. There is a problem though, and that's why if you didn't hear it or see it, I said fronds earlier, because they may not be fronds that are reaching up into the water column. There's been some more recent research that actually suggests they may have just been living flat on the seafloor, which would be a change in our ideas of them, but is also not entirely impossible. With those potential holdfasts though, we probably need to do a little bit more research on these organisms. As for why those organisms diversified, we actually need to go back to the Sturtian, which is a time period of snowball earth, which Pretty much what it sounds like, giant glaciers covering the planet about to the equator and may have even covered the equator occasionally. Now one important thing to remember about glaciers is they're heavy. If you go up into some parts of North America, there's something called isostatic rebound happening because of the loss of glaciers across large parts of the continent. Essentially, as those glaciers moved southward, they added so much weight that the crust of the earth actually sank down a little bit. And then eventually as they melted, now the crust can start rebounding because it's trying to get into balance with the general pressures and gravity that do exist on the planet. When Snowball Earth ended, the similar thing would have happened, but importantly, there's other things than just crust to think about, and those are specifically volcanoes and lava, because lava a lot of time comes from the mantle, which is solid and plastic, but as it approaches the surface, there's less pressure so it can turn into a liquid. And that's essentially what likely happened after the loss of glaciers. More of that lava was able to turn liquid and erupt, potentially changing water chemistry and causing a slight delay in the recovery of life after Snowball Earth. 
This is probably due to certain elements like sulfur and iron taking up a lot of oxygen as they got released into the water. However, importantly, there's also things like phosphorus that would have been released, and phosphorus is very important for life, making up part of DNA. This means that once there was oxygen buildup again after essentially all those sulfates and the iron had been accounted for, suddenly there was a ton of phosphorus running around that animals and other organisms could start using to build more of themselves meaning that potentially that's the reason there was this sudden burst of diversity for the UD Karen, and then later as that life got going, again in the Cambrian. And from the origins of life to the loss of a lot of life, we're actually going to be looking at the Permian-Triassic extinction and what its implications were for both the bivalves, so things like clams and mussels, but also the brachiopods, oftentimes called lamp shells that are similar as far as the way they live, but fundamentally evolved in a separate lineage. In the Permian, and even long before the Permian, the brachiopods were a lot more common than things like the bivalves. However, after this extinction, you get this massive shift where suddenly there's a lot more bivalves and a lot fewer brachiopods. This paper tried to see if it was directly the fault of the bivalves that caused the die-offs of the brachiopods, and what they found is that's probably not the case. Sure, there may have been a little bit of influence there, but mostly it seems like the environmental devastation is what led to the deaths of the brachiopods and many groups of the bivalves. It's just that the brachiopods did much worse because of those environments. So then later, when those different groups of brachiopods weren't there, suddenly bivalves had much more diversity and were able to evolve and fill those niches. So it was more an opportunistic filling of niches rather than direct competition that led to the broad diversity of bivalves we have today and the lower diversity of brachiopods. The extinction at the Permian Triassic was caused at least in part by the confluence of Pangaea, where all the continents were linked together and that caused a lot of volcanism because there's a lot of continental plates slamming into one another. It's one of those things that happened, however it also will happen in the future. It's estimated that in about 250 million years, a new Pangaea will actually come together. And these researchers essentially just looked at one of the models of what this new Pangaea could look like and tried to figure out what the climate would have been like there. And what they found is that oftentimes it would be far too hot for mammals to survive. And so people have been going, oh, that means all mammals are going to die. And it's not that, it's just that the mammals that do survive are going to be in very cold parts of the planet meaning essentially the very far north and the very far south. There's also probably going to be a few new mountain ranges that spring up in that time, just as continents come together. So there could also be mammals there. However, again, they're certainly not going to be as dominant on the planet as they are today. As for more recent mammal extinctions, another paper looked at how human influence may have actually caused the extinction of many of the large Ice Age megafauna. And specifically what they did is they actually looked at some mammals that were very large that went extinct before humans had even evolved. Meaning essentially we can look at their patterns of extinction and then compare it to the patterns of extinction for megafauna when humans were around. And rather than it just following the climate, it actually follows the human arrival to a region much more strongly. Meaning that sure climate probably had a part to play in the extinction of the megafauna, However, humans migrating across the planet was probably a more significant driver of their extinction. And staying in mammals, and actually things very close to us, we're going to be looking at primates from North America where they first evolved. This first paper looked at some new fossil occurrences of primates in the Uinta Basin of Utah and the Tornillo Basin of Texas. And they found that there's actually a few different species of primates from the Eocene in North America. Unfortunately, these fossils are mostly just teeth and molars and little bits of jawbone, but because mammals have such diverse teeth, it's actually really useful for identifying how they would have been related to one another. And that also means they were able to just say, hey, yeah, there's at least a number of different organisms, including things like Oria, Diablomomys, and Mitonius. So that's three entirely separate genera that would have been present in North America during the Eocene. They were doing relatively well. Unfortunately though, as the Miocene started to hit and the temperature started to cool, it seems like grasslands expanded and there's only really one primate that does incredibly well in grasslands and that's us. So it seems like the shrinkage of the forests and the transition to a more grassland dominated environment is what really led to their extinction. There's also a look at some North American primates from the group Nothartinae. And this is interesting because we actually have enough fossils 
to kind of estimate their sizes throughout time. And it seems like over a few million years, they increased in size from seven kilograms or so to about 15 kilograms. So from about 15 pounds total up until about 35 pounds. The first primates weren't exactly massive. However, it's really interesting to see some of those changes actually occur. And hopefully as we continue to look at their teeth a little more, we can try and understand their diets and just how reliant they likely were on those forested environments. Because again, similar stuff being said in this paper where, yeah, and they were doing well and then suddenly the grasslands went everywhere and they just couldn't hang on in North America. Even today, the deep sea can be really hard to study. And the thing with fossils from the deep sea is they have to get pushed up onto the surface of the land. So we don't have a ton of fossils from there, so it's really hard to say when vertebrates first made it to the deep oceans. However, a new paper shows trace fossils coming from the Cretaceous that do suggest, hey, at least some fish made it that deep during the Cretaceous about 135 million years ago. Now these traces aren't super exciting themselves. It's just showing some sort of fish trying to eat things that were under the sediment. So there's just little lines and pock marks of them trying to do that, pull up food from the sediment. And so we don't know exactly what kind of fish made it, but we at least know how it was living and that it made it there 135 to 130 million years ago. Staying in the oceans, the Rutland Sea Dragon was found in 2021 in Rutland in the UK. And it was actually found on an island sandbar in a river. So it's important to actually be able to pull the entire fossil out before it got covered again or eroded by that river. So they did that. And this paper basically just details what they know about it so far. There's still a lot of prep work that needs to be used in order to actually get the rest of the dirt off of the fossil. It's a specimen of Temnodontosaurus, a large ichthyosaur from the early Jurassic. And based on some of the other fossils that are microfossils in these sediments, it probably lived just after the Torsian Ocean Anoxic event, meaning there was a very small amount of oxygen relative to at other times in the water. This would have made it a lot harder for different forms of life to be able to continue living. So there's this big turnover we see in the oceans and this is from just after that and a large animal from just after that. So it's really good for understanding potentially how some of that anoxic event actually affected life around the planet. Staying with reptiles and in the UK and even in the Mesozoic, although a little bit earlier in the Triassic, Witcherworm trispiculum, which were a group of short squat reptiles coming from the Triassic, and in this case from the southern UK. It was found in a fissure fill, which for more on that, check out my video on Panty Draco because I go into that geology a lot more, but these have been really good for finding small animals from the Triassic of this part of Europe and especially the UK. It's also the most complete of the Procolophonids that are actually from the UK. So it's gonna be really useful for filling in more of these gaps as we continue to do more study on many of the small animals that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs because the dinosaurs are more fancy so they get more study, unfortunately. And speaking of dinosaurs, there's a new dromaeosaur found coming from Northeast China. And it seems like it was fairly large, potentially as large as some of the largest dromaeosaurs. So things like Utah Raptor but this one probably wouldn't be directly related to things like Utah Raptor. Instead, there's other large dromaeosaurs that it's more likely to be related to. And that includes things like from Mongolia, Achillobator, but also from Uzbekistan, an unnamed specimen that seemed to be a large dromaeosaur. So maybe across Central Asia, there is this lineage of really large dromaeosaurs and we just haven't found any of them yet. Additionally though, it may not be a dromaeosaur, at least one researcher, Andrea Cow, mentioned that, hey, the arms on this thing, which was unnamed also the new specimen, don't seem like a dromaeosaur. Instead, it seems like it was most likely a therizinosaur. And in the paper, they do compare the claws that they found to therizinosaurus. But even in therizinosaurs, therizinosaurus is a massive outlier. It'd be interesting to compare these claws to something more like Nothronychus, which has a little bit more of the traditional therizinosaurid claw shape. From the Wessex formation of the southern UK, there's also a new dinosaur, Vectodromius insularis. It's a hypsilophodontid, and it's interesting because it's actually a few million years older than Hypsilophodontosaurus, meaning that potentially this lineage was just super endemic to some of the archipelago around northern Europe at this time. We have to remember that Europe looked very different during the age of the dinosaurs. So it's really important to keep in mind that and that potentially some of these animals that we do find and are kind of famous because they come from Europe and were some of the first dinosaurs found might be very, very hyper-specialized to that specific environment. 
And then there was a look at growth in crocodilians, and this time a specific Notosuchian, meaning it lived on land, from the Cretaceous. And it's actually the South American Ariepasuchus, which is interesting because it seemingly had a higher metabolism than most modern day crocodilians. And this would have been because it was walking around on land and needed to chase down prey as opposed to simply ambushing it from the water. In birds and mammals that grow fast, they have something called fibromelar bone, and it helps them to grow fast. And Arepasuchus doesn't have that. It did not grow in the same way that things like birds or mammals grow when they're experiencing rapid growth. They were doing something fundamentally different, but still had a very heightened metabolism. So not exactly sure why and what exactly that means for their overall biology, but it's interesting. And hopefully there'll be some more research on that so you can really get an idea of what these animals were doing. And finally, there was a new paper on reproduction in rhinos, and specifically a rhino from 18 million years ago. This one was fairly young, it was a subadult. They were able to look at the teeth in some of the wear patterns to try and understand how exactly it would have grown up. And it seems like it was probably drinking its mother's milk for at least two years, which also suggests that the mother was probably investing a lot of time into this animal. It suggests that perissodactyls, which are animals with one or three hooves, the odd toed ungulates, were probably ancestrally at least giving birth to just one young at a time, as opposed to many young. So it's not so much a litter as it is just here's an offspring, maybe two if it's a really good year. And then finally, we are jumping into papers that I did entire videos on. So be sure to check those out if you wanna see a little more, but we have an entire refutation of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Younger Dryas had some weird climatic events and some people have said, ah, clearly this is a meteor impact that caused this. There's not a ton of evidence for that. It was probably something different. There's also a look at the Pseudosuchian Riohasuchus, which had this really large, prominent nose. Probably wouldn't have been good at shaking things side to side, but would have been really good at pulling, meaning potentially it was hunting just smaller prey that it could just pull straight down into its gullet. So it's interesting to see how some of these jaws actually worked and how they may have worked differently compared to some of the dinosaurs. Because this is a Pseudosuchian, it's really closely related to crocodilians but they were the dominant predators on land before the dinosaurs. And they even lived alongside dinosaurs, but the dinosaurs at the time weren't large. It seems like it really took the death of the Pseudosuchians to have the dinosaurs rise up, and especially the theropods rise up into dominant predator niches. There's also a look at some terror bird footprints, and it suggests that the terror birds actually lifted their innermost toe, kind of like a raptor dinosaur or the dromaeosaurs. This means that potentially they're doing something similar, using this claw to actually hold down prey and then using the beak to do more of the dispatching. This is actually similar to what we see in the terror bird's closest living relative, the red-legged Siriema. So interesting to see, and hopefully there'll be a little more research on this. We can try and understand better what the terror birds were doing because they're really, really interesting. There was also a look at one of the earliest diverging dinosaurs in the bird lineage. So it was closer related to the birds than it would have been to things like the dromaeosaurs or truodontids, which were very bird-like dinosaurs. But depending on your definition, it may not have been a true bird, but rather a stem bird. This is Fuji Invenator. And it's interesting because it shows a broad suite of different characteristics that are similar to, in some cases, dromaeosaurs, and in many cases, birds, and sometimes truodontids. It helps to show that there was really this kind of hodgepodge branch of evolution that did eventually lead to the birds with their modern day anatomy the way we know them. But hey, if conditions were different, who knows? Maybe birds wouldn't be quite the way they are today. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'm gonna put the SVP, so Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Futures donation link down on the bottom here because it's a good program. It helps provide scholarships to people who are normally very underrepresented in paleontology. I really appreciate seeing some support on these videos because the monthly reviews don't normally do as well, unfortunately. That said, I think it's an important service, so I do plan on continuing them. If you want to continue to support the channel, feel free to check out our Patreon, where you can get some extra perks, like voting for the What the Hell videos, so that you can look at what other organism we're talking about. Thanks everyone, be safe, take care, don't go extinct!